it starts off with their birth. And um, I thought it was important to show because some people like maybe look at, look at people like me and just think of, oh, that's an other, that's a foreigner. And, a, and I wanted to show Mike here, you're witnessing her birth. You know, it's with a Japanese midwife, but it's in Los Angeles and kind of yeah. take people. Welcome to our latest book reporter talks to interview where our guest today is Naomi Hirohara. Her latest mystery is historical Clark and division is set in 1944 Chicago. It's a book reporter bets on selection. I absolutely love this book. Now I'm going to tell you a little thing, a couple of things. I've had passing conversations with Naomi in the past at conferences, more like, do you want to have a drink? Here's your drink. And then a little bit of gossip, but we've never really had a conversation about anything in depth. And I'll also confess here, this was the first book of hers that I read, which is like a big admission coming out from me. But by the same token, it's quite an entry point. So welcome, Naomi. It's so nice to have you here today. Thank you for having me, Carol. And so now let's start by you telling us about Clark and Division. Yeah, Clark and Division is a story about two sisters. It's also about a Japanese American family, the Ito family and who live in a part of Los Angeles that's called Tropical, at least back then. And um, then um, during World War II, the family is forcibly removed and um, they're held at Manzanar, which is um, at the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas in a place called Owens Valley in a detention center with 10,000 other Japanese Americans. And um, there's early release for a select, select number of people all Nisei or second generation Japanese Americans who are born here, American citizens. So Rose, the older sister um, is selected for this and she goes off to Chicago. And um, a, a year later, um, the younger sister Aki who absolutely adores her older sister and her two um, Issei or immigrant Japanese immigrant parents go to Chicago only to discover that something tragic has happened. Mm. So it's really up to Aki, who's been in the shadow of her sister to kind of, to find out what has happened, to find out the truth, as well as to carry her parents through this very tumultuous time period. Mm. It's just so well done. So what inspired the writing for this? What made you say, this is a story I really wanna tell? You know, I've always wanted to tell a story of, um, from the point of view of a Nisei woman. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why is there, like when I worked, I worked at a Japanese American newspaper as a reporter and editor, and I'm, my, I myself was, I'm kind of a Nisei in myself because my um, mother is from Japan. Okay. So anyway, the Nisei, you know, they, they are, have a very optimistic view on life, at least the ones I encountered. And it was kind of hard to puncture the veneer you know, um, the very positive veneer. And I knew behind it was a lot of um, suffering that had, you know, and trauma that had occurred during World War II. But, you know, I think it was a point of pride for many of these women that they didn't want the government, they didn't want other people to kind of see what was going on internally. So I actually did a story for Megan Abbott um, for a small collection um, that she was working on and of short stories. And this one was kind of like the dark, dark side of the Nisei woman. And this, uh, it was more noir and she, this it was set in the fifties and this woman ends up cutting up her <laughs> white lover and putting them in parts into a suitcase and dropping it into the ocean. But of course, that's not really a short story that, um, <laughs> you know, that the Nisei or their children could really relate to. And that, so I, I was just on this quest. I'm going to keep continuing on. And there's another reason I had, I write nonfiction too. And with my brother, friend, um, uh, Heather Lindquist, we co-wrote a book called Life After Manzanar, which kind of uh, explores what happened to people after they were released. So that's where I got the nonfiction nuggets to um, meld into my book. And then Megan made you make it a little bit darker, just a little bit darker, you know? <laughs> well, some people love that, but I was going, you know, this is the task to take something that's 
that dark things are happening, yet the mm -hmm. person is intrinsically, she is, there's something, uh, she has a, a kind of endurance and stamina and even hope inside of her. Mm -hmm. You know, I confess that I never realized that anyone, when they, once they went to the camps, went anyplace else. I never knew anybody was moved anyplace else. Obviously, you know, we were, I think we went so in depth in history and like, you know, World War II, we were in school and obviously we dashed like right through this. I didn't know that this something happened. Why were the people moved? Like, why were some people allowed to leave the one detention center and really go to someplace else that was kind of occupied in a lot of ways? Well, you know, the government wanted, you know, kind of assimilation. I think, you know, and um, the Quakers, the um, American Friends Service, they were also helping. They wanted a better future for the Nisei. So this kind of diaspora was in the works. Um, you know, and it's expensive to hold people in confinement, you know, mm -hmm. so there's also that aspect of releasing people, but they told people in places like Chicago, do not congregate in numbers more than three, which was impossible, of course. Mm -hmm. But as a result, there was this message of do not um, create like a Japantown or a little Tokyo, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's why a lot of people, even Chicago, don't know that like before World War II, only 400 Japanese Americans by the mid 40s, 20,000. Wow. And then there was again, you know, a movement back to the West. So it's kind of an erased story. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that really fascinates me because I love history is to kind of um, dig out these hidden mm -hmm. um, communities mm -hmm. and kind of showing it to people and saying, hey, there was this that had to happen. Right. There was this, and there are parallels today. There are parallels to what's going on. We've done this before, and this is what had ended up happening. And I just, I remember the stories of people being just rounded up after Pearl Harbor and saying, you know, you are going here, this is what you're doing, leaving livelihoods, leaving great jobs, leaving companies that they'd built and leaving just with the suitcase. And then we sit there and realize, you know, we're coming in, we're taking a number of Jewish people. We're saying, you're leaving with just a suitcase. Same thing was going on here with American citizens. Exactly. And it's just, I, I thought they just went to some place and then after the war, everybody was released and they went back home. I had no idea what happened in the middle. Yeah, well, a lot of people attempted to go back home, but, you know, for those immigrants who had built up their businesses, now they're middle-aged, you know, it's not, they can't do that, you know, so they have to, a lot of people got into domestic health, a mm -hmm. lot of people got into gardening, which is the subject of my Maserai series. So yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's where they went from there. Well, did any of your family members go through this? Did any of your family members, um, were they living here in the States at the time, go to camps, have to move? Um, my extended family, not my parents, but my um, father's um, aunt and uncle. And he, they had like 13 kids and, you know, all, there's a bunch of Hirohara's in, um, up north, um, kind of like in John Steinbeck country. Mm -hmm. They were all involved in, you know, cultivating the salad bowl of America and farming. So they lived in a beautiful Victorian house. Um, actually, you could even Google like Redmond is the architect in Hirohara and it'll come up on Wikipedia. But um, and but they temporarily lost the house. Um, they were they went all the way to Arkansas, which is crazy, right? California to crazy. Arkansas. And crazy. they but but they were uh, able to regain the house. And that actually almost became a hostel for mm -hmm. people returning back. And my dad, my father, who's actually an atomic bomb survivor, um, he when he returned back to Watsonville, he lived in that house as well. Wow. So that was like the communal point for everyone to come in. If you need a way station, this is it. Exactly. C mm -hmm. Kind of like what Clark and Division was, which is an intersection in Chicago. Yeah, the intersection of those two streets. Yeah. yeah. Chicago, Chicago is so interesting. If you walk around Chicago, and I've done that like more than once because every conference seemed to be set in Chicago either in the winter, either that or I was there one time and I think it was like 104 in the summer. And I'm like, are right. you really kidding me? Everybody says it's so cold and they're like, oh, no, no, no. You just need the lake effect like wind coming in. I'm like, there's no lake effect wind today, you know, nothing. But, um, but if people were sent, as I did some more extensive reading is they were in Denver. They were like all over the country. People were yeah. kind of deported to, if you want to say that, because like, here your train ticket, go make a life for yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were efforts, um, there were war relocation authority kind of offices that did assist people in getting jobs and those kind of things. 
But you can imagine like in Chicago, which is such a labor town, mm -hmm. they didn't necessarily tell the unions, by the way, there's all these Japanese Americans going to come and they're going to look for work, you know, so there was some cases of some struggle or tension, but they events eventually got resolved. Yeah, yeah, it's survival is a very big theme in the book. And I feel like people are living so much in the moment. And honor is such a big element in the Japanese mm -hmm. community. Yeah. And it was heartbreaking to see these very proud people leaving their lives and becoming broken people in Chicago. Was that tough writing? Because you really get involved with your characters. And here you've got this prominent gentleman and this, you know, um, this woman who's like, you know, groomed, whatever. And now they're there, she's scrubbing floors, she's doing whatever she can do. And he's kind of becoming a drunk because he can't even cope. Tough writing? Yeah, and it, actually the family, like I'm more from peasant stock, <laughs> not from proud, like th this is basically a middle-class family. You know, mm -hmm. they were living in a white community back in Los Angeles. So um, yeah, so I had to kind of inhabit the mind of Aki and her family. And yeah, pride is a really big thing. And what surprised me was like, I personally feel like great gratitude towards the Quakers that had helped them. But when Aki goes and she's waiting to be helped at this war relocation authority office and the Quakers are helping, she feels resentment towards them because mm -hmm. she goes, well, I don't want to even be in the situation where I need help, you mm -hmm. know, and that kind of surprised me. I go, Aki, but, you know, but, but I, I totally, you know, kind of followed her uh, her kind of point of view and with the mother too, um, the way she reacts, although she's doing domestic work, she has, she still has that pride, Yes, you know, and don't feel sorry for me, you know, which was kind of surprising again. So um, more than tough writing, I guess it's, you're just inhabiting the minds of these people and you just got to go, you know, where they go. Yeah. And it's also, I think that people are in a period of shock as well. We had a hurricane here last week in, um, in New Jersey, and yes. we were not affected like many people, which, you know, everything's gone. And you watch these people on the news and they're talking and you realize there's an element of like, we will build whatever, but you also realize there's an element of shock of a not really understanding that what's happened is gone and things move so quickly for these families. Like, yes, they're in the camp for a really long time, but then it's go, 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 get on the train. You're going to, you're going to go meet your daughter who's already gone ahead. It's almost like you're in you're in a mode of just move ahead, move ahead, not really thinking emotionally, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's totally a big part of it. And um, I think that Juliet Grams, my editor, she took me to task on some points, like, come on, you know, what are they thinking? What are, you know, so I had to almost explain, like, why weren't they um, verbally expressing all of these things that were happening. I mean, I think for some of them, they could not even understand how they're feeling. And I, I've, I myself have felt that, you know, at times where there's, where I just feel like I have to plow ahead. Mm -hmm. And especially if you feel responsible, like to immigrant parents, you're almost parenting your parents. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you're in this like mold, let's take care of it, you know, and not you, uh, you know, I, I myself hasn't, haven't been in this position where, you know, someone else tells me, oh, you know, comforts me and tells me everything's okay. So I'm able to sit in my emotions. You know, it's more like moving much like yeah. the Ito family does. Yeah. Just keep on going, keep on going. And what I felt is like, Aki's there and she's, she's, she's young. She's more resilient on things, but then she gets hit with the whole family gets hit with this other news that their daughter Rose, the one that they were, her sister Rose, that she was trying to meet up with is dead. And under very, like, no one's really sure of the circumstances. They go and they see the body, but it's really what happened to her. So there's a whole other layer on top of their story of not just moving, but it's not reuniting with your family. Was mm -hmm. that something that you always knew that there was going to have, I mean, come on, you write mysteries, but there was always going to be that element in this book, or was that something that came as you were writing? No, it, it was central you know, mm -hmm. and it was just built. Um, I was, <laughs> I also had to step in to the viewpoint of a younger sister and mm -hmm. I'm an older sister. So I'm, you know, 
um, the one who's always taking care of things. And a lot of times I don't think about my younger brother, like how it is for him. So I actually had to interview some of my friends who are like younger sisters, you know, they're the, they're not the star, their older sister is, but then what happens, you know, right. when that person is not around and you have to change, you know, so that, that's another thing. I mean, I love history, but, you know, since I write fiction, it can't just be history. It has to be some other arc that's, you know, character arc that's happening. And in uh, Clark and Division, it is definitely about sisters and mm -hmm. losing your sister. Yeah. And I just feel like um, it opens that Rose is present at Aki's birth. Like that is that moment that she's been there the whole time for her sister. And you write so well about the sisterly bond. Now, I understand you don't have a sister. You have brothers. Yeah. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Just yes. one brother. Yeah. One brother. Yeah. So it's like a lot of interviewing about, you know, like what that was going to be. So, and meanwhile, Rose is this big personality. She's mm -hmm. sort of the light of the family and they arrive in Chicago. And I feel like the light dims like really quickly because it's what happened. And it's not only what happened to her, it's like the light is gone and who is now going to pick up and turn on the light and make it all happen. And there's a moment where Aki dons her clothes and she's going to wear her clothes. And it's almost like, I feel like she's trying to slip into her life. Mm -hmm. and slip into, can I not become her, but can I fashion a part of her by doing this? Am I right? Yeah, definitely. And then in the beginning, um, we witness um, Aki's birth and actually, you know, sent, uh, Rose is central and we know her name. We don't even know Aki's name until yes. a little bit later. Right. And that was on purpose. But um but it's also a breach birth, an unusual birth. So Aki actually is an unusual person, mm -hmm. but she hasn't yet claimed that part of herself, mm -hmm. you know, because her sister has taken so much space, mm -hmm. but she hasn't really claimed her own identity. So yeah, she's playing with all these things, like wearing the dresses. And, you know, people are paying attention to her in a new way. I mean, she's 20, so she's right. on this cusp, right? Of, right. And it's not because she's trying to be like Rose, it's because she's Aki. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the book too, and it's, there's some romance in there as well, you know? Oh yeah, it is because we really feel like we, we get to know her as a person. We get to know her as a teenager. She's not a fully, like, fully formed. This is, and she's trying things for the first time. She's getting herself in trouble for the first time, but she's also seeking because she still feels like she can figure out what's going on with her sister. And then like one of the things she does is she gets this job at a library. And while her parents are doing what's considered more menial work, she is determined that she's going to do something that's kind of out of the comfort zone of what you would actually go do. So she goes to work at the Newberry Library. So just tell us about that place because I'm sorry I've been to Chicago a couple of times. I've never been there because you make it sound oh. fabulous. You know? Yeah, you have to go there. Actually, one of the people I dedicated the book to, uh, Sue Kunitomi Embry, she was um, incarcerated in Manzanar and she actually fought for Manzanar to be a historic site. Mm. She herself had worked at the Newberry and she said it was an eye-opening experience. She, she, before she was mostly sheltered in the Japanese American community. And now she's you know, rubbing elbows with people outside of her ethnicity and race. So mm. she really enjoyed it. So when I, I had a walking tour, I have a social historian that took me around Clark and Division. There's hardly anything left, but I told him, oh, let's go. I saw on the map, Newberry's walking distance. Let's go to the Newberry. And I was shocked because I this is my ignorance. I didn't realize that it, it, it's such a world-class reference library. Mm -hmm. And it's very grand and beautiful floors. And I was just, you know, picturing Sue like coming from this dusty Owens Valley, you know, and tar paper barracks. And then this, then she walks into this beautiful historic building and this is where she's gonna spend her days working. Mm -hmm. so, so I go, I, you know, so that definitely, I, I told myself I had to put my lead character in that library. Yeah, and she's at this very elegant place. She's at this place where people are coming in to do like, you know, scholarly work, whatever. And then she's going home and she's dealing with the ice man and how do you get the ice brought into the refrigerator and what is this like this whole new life for themselves because that wasn't the way they were living before so there's she's got all these different tones and then at the same time she's young she wants to go meet people she wants to have friends she wants to go out and when she goes out she cultivates relationships with people that are more well off their families and she's like wait a second 
Japanese as well. How are you having a totally different world in life than we're having? And I thought that you were bringing in class and structure there and then breaking it down every single time. So am I on? <laughs> yeah, you're definitely on. I mean, one of the people she meets is like a medical student who's from the Midwest. So people who actually live are from the Midwest, they didn't, they weren't incarcerated. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a totally different kind of life and attitudes, you know, and station in life. Um, what I loved about writing Clark and Division is I could write so many young characters mm -hmm. and each one of them has a different response to mm -hmm. what has happened to them. And so I, in that way, you could kind of see the variety, you know, it's not just one monolithic, like, you know, uh, uh, resentment towards the government. Some people are happy they're in Chicago. They're, you know, they feel this is a new lease on their life. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And it's not like everybody went out to the fields together. People are doing different things. And when they're getting together socially, people are still going to find fun. They're still going to find joy in the, but it's not going to be the same kind of things they were doing before. And there, she's actually experiencing a new culture. Aki's like, you know, the, the whole thing is new to her. It's fresh to her, but it's, by the same time, it's invigorating her at the same time as she's still feeling the loss of her sister. And she's walking through town, I feel, town, the city, trying to picture the city through her sister's eyes. What did her sister see? What happened to her there? Because mm -hmm. she's trying to solve the mystery that we can't really yes. talk about or will give away too much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And in terms of the young people, I mean, that was another thing when I was doing my nonfiction research, because the average age of the Nisei in Chicago was their mid-20s. So some of them did get into trouble. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying all, but they're enough no. so that a uh, report came out in the mid 40s saying we have to do something about these juvenile delinquents. Mm -hmm. There's babies being born out of wedlock. There's, um, you know, abortions, which are, which are illegal at the time. There's, you know, this crime and that crime. So I that kind of shocked me because it wasn't something that was spoken of. And, you know, I, I've worked a lot with the community documenting things. And when I looked back at oral histories, people were talking around it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why I thought, oh, writing a mystery is in fiction is like the best way because the people who know the truth, they're gone now. Mm -hmm. But so I could kind of insert, you know, we're all people. And, and that was my goal is to uh, write about the humanity of these people that sometimes um, Japanese Americans are spoken of as a model minority. Look at these people. They, you know, they're unscathed of what happened to them. Why don't you be more like this? But I really wanted to see there was a lot of trauma and people did suffer and people did act up because mm -hmm. these were young people without parental, you know, supervision. Mm -hmm. So they're just like anyone else. <laughs> but it's like, but they're Japanese. So now we're going to look at what you're being um being measured by a different goal. There's a different benchmark of what everybody was looking at you for. So you could get in more trouble in some ways just because they could look at you and say, oh, but you're the one that did it no matter yeah. what. Yeah, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So people, um, so Chicago, does Chicago still have a vibrant Japanese culture? Like, is there still like living in that area or whatever in, in Chicago? You know, a lot of them are on the outskirts or live in the suburbs. Um, there, there's two. There were hardly any Buddhist temples before World War II, and now there's at least two vibrant ones. But it's not like if you go to Los Angeles here, you just see you know the beautiful temples and it's very ornate. Um, the, these buildings are not like that, and I think it's a legacy of just being told you know don't stand out you know um but uh they also well summertime they're known for their chicken teriyaki dinners really i mean it, intense i i went to one a few years years ago before the pandemic and you know it it was um interesting to see how the culture kind of manifests itself and they have a japanese american um, service committee they, they have like a uh, historic um, society there that mm -hmm. has a lot of it, it's a repository of a lot of uh, photographs and documents and I, I do think that there's going to be more and more interest about this mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. so I expect more projects and things to be happening in the future yeah no it was just it was completely interesting then a lot of people did go back to California and rebuilt their lives mm -hmm. and they had to go back as you say middle-aged or whatever and pick up the pieces 
And mm -hmm. what happened to all of their belongings? Like everything was packed up and they were put in a warehouse or whatever. Did they get their things back? A lot, a lot of people did. You know, they were stored at uh, temples and churches and some people, you know, their items were ransacked. So again, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, and, and other people, you know, their friends and neighbors supported them. So it, uh, you know, there's a multitude of different results and stories. Of what ended up happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also thought it was interesting that the young men were conscripted into the war. Like, okay, so fine, yes. you've been, you've been mm -hmm. moved, you've been, you know, mm -hmm. dispatched to this other place and now you're gonna do that. It was something I didn't know. And I feel like a lot of the history that we know was left out. It was kind of whitewashed through the years. Now you studied Japanese American history for a long time. Is there something that we're trying to convey in this book? Because I found myself learning so much. So what we've been talking about before is you're really trying to bring this to light and bring us, but in a story format, I didn't feel like I was being beat over the head. It wasn't history class. Yeah, you know, I, what um, my editor, Juliet and I, um, talked about is how to start the book and you know most mysteries you start off with a dead body you know mm -hmm. I one way would have been to start it off in Chicago mm -hmm. um, but actually my agent was going no Naomi you know I she thought it was really important to show the family before you mm -hmm. know what what they had been before and I agreed with that and so we went back and forth so now you know it starts off with their birth and um, I thought it was important to show because some people like maybe look at look at people like me and just think of oh that's an other that's a foreigner and a, and I wanted to show Mike here you're witnessing her birth you know it's with a Japanese midwife but it's in Los Angeles and kind of yeah. take people through you know and she's only 20 years old so kind of to, to show the whole breadth of her life and um yeah and it just show i think the fact that it's set in chicago that's intrigued people you mm -hmm. know and 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 that the midwest has a slice of this history that they didn't realize they had so yeah, yeah. i agree you know it's interesting too though because what you're talking about is you have the discussion with your agent you have discussion with your um editor so many times people think you just sit down and write a book and then you go on from there but that conversation of how you're going to shape the book from the start even if you hand in a manuscript, they may say, take chapter four, move it forward, do this, that, the other thing. And you have to trust each other in order to be able to do that. So is this the first time you've worked with Juliet? Have you been together before working on books or is this first round? This is the first round and it, yeah. it was a lovely experience, but a, a slightly, I mean, we we're doing it in the middle of the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. and for uh, a few months, um, actually, uh, Juliet took a leave of absence, you know, she mm. was trying to help the press too, right. you know, so and I didn't know, you know, uh, Clark and Division was supposed to come out in this May, and then it got delayed. And my mentality, I was back in the before times, and I was going, Oh, it's going to miss the LA Times Festival of books, mm -hmm. you know, my naive day, but it's like, <laughs> no. we're still in it. And at a certain, I know at a certain point, I just told Julia, whenever, whenever you feel like you want to publish it, just publish it. And it turned out like actually August, you know, 2021 was like the perfect time for the book. It really was. It was really the perfect. Mm -hmm. thing. And it's these things that we don't know. I know like you, I used to travel and do a lot of these things. And I'm like, oh, like somebody saying, oh, do you want to go to Tucson? I'm like, wait a second. This all began the Tucson Festival book was canceled and that's the week I got COVID. So like, let's, let's just go back in time, folks. Like, wait a second, we're circling around to that wagon again. And a lot of people are talking about when they're going to go back to the office. And I go, let's just say January and make it easy. Like, let's just do this. Let's just go further out. And if we surprise ourselves and it's sooner, mm -hmm. let's do it. But I feel like we've had so much of um, just plans shot up in the air that right now that I feel like we're just going with the flow. It's like, okay, that's yeah. not going to work. Uh, we'll try something else. It's okay. Yeah. It's going to be fine. Where's I think you yeah. dug your heels in. You would have dug your heels in and go, that's not going to work because of the festival. And now it's like, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. You, and, and I'm glad, I mean, I was thinking too, maybe around three or four months ago when we were kind of more optimistic with all the vaccines, like mm -hmm. that I could do more in-person events. You know, yeah. I have been able to do a few and I'm actually going to Printer's Row this weekend. Oh, fun, fun. You know? You know, and some things were up in the air for that, but I just go, I'll just go with the flow. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I think that's what we've had to become. It's like what you have to do. And it's like, you know, okay, do we need a third round of the vaccine? What are we doing? We're like, okay, fine. Whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. You know, mm -hmm. and if I got to put the mask back on, that's what we're going to do. Whereas last year, it was, I have to admit that not Lysoling all day long is a good thing. 
And I yes. was in my car the other day and I found this huge thing of Lysol wipes, <laughs> huge top like this in the center console. And I realized that I drove into the city and I used to bring my car around. And then I proceed to wipe down the entire inside of my car, like every single thing before I left, because there was a speck of the COVID, like, you know, might get through. And I'm just sitting there like, oh my gosh, what were we doing? We were washing yeah. our groceries. I mean, think about the wipe, wiping down the yeah, mail. No outside that that's the only time I really was thinking of having a meltdown yeah you know, when I was wiping I was going I can't keep doing that <laughs> no 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 I went down and I, I said it's a whole staff go home one day and it was before the city started shut down I said just go home I said because yeah. you know what I don't want to see everybody's faces on the subway anymore because the other thing is being in a city it's mass transit it's not like LA you're yes. driving in your car yes. you're yes. with you get on with how many numbers of people somebody sneezes and everybody thinks they're going to get ill so it's like oh let's just give this up and it's funny because We've all done this work from home thing and I'm actually getting more done because I'm not commuting. Right. I'm actually doing, getting yeah. to attend more events because I lived in New Jersey, work in New York, but so then I'd have to go to the event in the city. So I get home super late. Yeah. So now I just log on at seven o'clock or eight o'clock. And somebody actually said the other night that the optimal time for events is nine o'clock. And I was like, who knew? And they said, well, think about it, television and watching television. What do you do? Nine o'clock is the prime hour. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need to shift the way we're thinking. And I read this article the other day and I said, isn't this really funny that we always think everything has to happen at six or seven. Whereas really that's usually when you're eating dinner and then nine o'clock is when you do entertainment. So mm -hmm. it's this rethinking of everything that's going on. Let's just, I don't know. So but we're in that moment of like, let's just roll. We'll just roll. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The editor's not around. Well, we'll just wait till that book comes out, you know. <laughs> but the book, what speaking of which, was inspired by a true crime. And when did you discover that? And what did you pull from it? We, get, we can't give anything away to everybody. Um, it, it was from that report that I found. And it actually is very sketchy. Um, I just knew that, um, unfortunately, I don't think anyone was brought to justice mm -hmm. um, because I, it was, I, I hadn't heard of it. And I think if, if someone had, there would be more documentation of it. Mm -hmm. So that to me was sad as well. And I thought, well, um, you know, so I, I, I thought in Clark and Division, I could at least, um, you know, give recognition to, mm -hmm. you know, the people who had gone through it. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, it, it happened, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's social issues that are worn into the book as well, like abortion and women's rights. And we don't want to give up too much away, but did you about, know about those before you started or just those? I mean, you knew a crime had happened up front. You knew certain pieces, but did you know that there was going to be such a, um, not a strident, but a really strong look at this is what was going on in this time that we really weren't talking about? Well, when, when I looked at that report and mentioned abortions, which surprised me, so I started doing a deep dive um, there's a book by a historian called When Abortion Was a Crime. And when I picked that up, it was actually gave a lot of examples from Chicago. Mm -hmm. So it was just, you know, kismet. That's mm -hmm. kind of what happens. And a lot of things were in the newspaper, you know, that of the time. Mm -hmm. So I was able to do a deep dive on that. So once I saw, you know, that was a, a big piece mm -hmm. of the mystery puzzle that kind of helped give more structure to the book. Yeah. 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 And you traveled to Chicago for research. You were lucky before COVID, you got to go travel. No, exactly, you know? exactly. What were some of the things that were searching for there? Did you just want to stand on the street, stand on the corner of Clark and Division and see how it felt and sort of walk those streets to get some feeling? Was there something specific you were going for? Um, yeah, I, okay, so... One thing, I don't live in Chicago, right? So this was um, a big challenge for me, you know, and I know there's a lot of Chicago pride. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I was going to be really held to a high standard. So that's what made me, this Clark and Division time was, it was basically a way station and it wasn't a permanent area where people lived. Um, people moved out to an area called Lakeview. There are people on the south side. So not much was known. So I did want to walk the streets and I did have my friend who was the guide who had Google mapped like former boarding homes and, mm. you know, various stores. And um, it's kind of eerie. I, you know, 
you do you're an archaeologist because in front of me is like a osco a huge osco drugstore but there was you know some other historic buildings that had been there there was an la tanning salon <laughs> you know so but a couple buildings were still intact and one was the mark twain hotel yeah. uh, which is right now sro housing and uh, my my friend Eric, he's more of a polite Midwestern person. I'm a former journalist, so it's like I just went through the doors, and he's going, "I've never been here before," and 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 looked at some of the you know uh, internal kind of design of the building. So that was helpful. And there was also a, a building that had held you know had been a former boarding home apartment for a lot of Japanese Americans. And that was, we didn't go inside, but at least I could see the building. Mm -hmm. So all of those things, yeah, um, helped inform the piece for sure. You know, and I, it's more like I didn't want to miss anything. Mm -hmm. You know, if there was something that I didn't describe that, that really was a marker for people, you know, that, that would not be good. Oh, and to go to the park. But um, the bug house uh, mm -hmm. part that was um, on the other side of the Newberry, you know, that was important too. Did you get out to wherever the candy factory was? Like, is that still there? Um, no, that's not there. That, mm -hmm. That's really kind of a, a very shishi kind of tourist area now. But mm -hmm. that that I had to rely more on photographs, you know. Mm -hmm. So bless uh, Google Maps and yeah. <laughs> bless the internet because that that was helpful. Yeah, but I know I've I've heard you talk about you have a love hate relationship with like you know um, let's say ways and all those kinds of things that get you places because you want to see the big scheme of it like where's yeah. Clark and Division in reference to everything else and it's funny the other day my son was headed up, headed up to Vancouver and he's talking about going to Vancouver Island I had to take a map to see exactly where this is because ways would tell me how to get there in like forty two hours but I wanted to see where it was like where yeah. are you headed and I think. We, list, we, we miss out on maps so much. And remember, like, yeah. you know, following the trail. Oh, yeah, okay. exactly. One place I went, I was taken to was the Montrose Cemetery. Oh. And that's where a lot of Japanese Americans, they, they were not allowed to be buried in certain places, and which is very common with a lot of ethnic groups. And they had a, a mausoleum for the Japanese that was built before World War II. So it was just... Um, it was just to stand there, you know, in the cemetery and see the headstones and the mausoleum. I think just feeling more emotional connection mm -hmm. to what was there before. And the topography doesn't change. If they were standing on a hill, it's still a hill. Mm -hmm. If you were standing on the sidewalk, it might be cracked now, but it's still the sidewalk that ran through that place. It didn't get wider or narrower. It's exactly mm -hmm. the way it was. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking even the hair salon was at the Mark Twain Hotel. Is that yes. what the hair salon was? Mm -hmm. So just picturing them walking up the steps there to go get their hair done. And if it's yeah. an SRO now, they're still the same steps, you know? Right. And yeah. And hair was very important. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hair was very, and her getting her hair done exactly the right way was, you know, something that was really important. The voice in this book is so spot on. And I heard the voice in my head. Did you always know it? Because um, I heard her in my head. Was it always first person as well that she was telling the story? It, yes. It had to be first person because... I felt that's what I could bring to the book that maybe um, other writers might have difficulty um, because I think I knew the voice. Um, mm -hmm. I think other people could write about the same topic, but they might choose to do it um, through third person, mm -hmm. you know, and, and embellish it with beautiful, right, you know, descriptions. But I, I wanted the preciseness, the honesty, just mm -hmm. the you know, down to earth, I wanted to capture, you know, kind of what a Nise woman was thinking. Mm -hmm. So yeah, first person, also, it had to be first person. Her innocence as well, because mm -hmm. she doesn't know every single thing. She's coming to know a lot of things. She's coming to know that the world is not what she thought it was. And she's coming to terms with that. She's coming to terms with her sister being gone. We're having to rely on her parents who she really can't rely on anymore. And these, I feel like every day it's a multiple decisions are being made. And that's not what she was geared for. It's not what she was mm -hmm. set up for. And now all of a sudden she's got to drop herself into that gear to get ahead, mm -hmm. drive one or the other. Yeah. You know? And it may describe what we're going through now. You know, mm -hmm. we all maybe had a, a naivete before <laughs> COVID, you know, and, well, and, and it was interesting this summer. So many people were discovering the national parks. So many mm -hmm. people, like there were days that they were filled and things like that. 
Well, there are so many times where people are going out and experiencing things in this country where people would have hopped a plane and gone to Europe. People would have hopped a plane and gone to Asia. They would have hopped a plane and gone to the Caribbean. And I was even hearing, this was, oh my gosh, a couple of months ago, somebody was looking to fly to the Caribbean for Christmas. And the plane tickets are so ridiculously yeah. expensive because yeah. they know there's a demand that they could actually yeah. do that yeah. people are going to want to do this. Right. So we flip the whole boat of like last year, you could fly to LA for like, you know, $170 mm -hmm. to now to go to the Caribbean, it's $3,500, $2,500. And you just see the shifting of, we went back to, we stripped everything away last year. And now mm -hmm. it's going to be very interesting to see what we layer back on as necessary. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and, and going to those exotic places right now, are, it, it can be not in all cases, but it can be super stressful for, you yes. know, you can't get your rental car, you know, and all these kind of things. Yeah. I, well, I've, a friend was in Hawaii and they said they decided to only go to one island and they were only going to do this and they've limited their vacation, but they said they were the only ones on Waikiki Beach yesterday. And they said, it's just, it's taking its toll because also people don't want to stress the healthcare system there. Yeah. How can everybody do yeah. their part? And I think it's become a lot more of, at the beginning, everybody was a little bit selfish. And now it's how can everybody do their part a little bit more? Yeah, mm -hmm. there's tripping up that's going on. But at the same token, I think that everybody's learned that there is something you have to do that's beyond you. And we finally mm -hmm. have to take a look at that. Yeah, we're all connected, you know, mm -hmm. around yeah, the world. We're going to mm -hmm. do. So there is a map inside the book, the regret book. Mm -hmm. There's this great map, and I loved it because I'm like this map person. Like the yes. maps. So yeah. right in the front, was this always planned to be in the book with all the locations so people could see? Yeah, um, actually, Soho is known to do that, and I, it was an early request. Yeah. Because you know, because I'm talking about intersection, like Clark and Division, right? And I'm so, you know, proud of the way the whole book came out. Actually, Carol, this is kind of my first hardcover release. I mean. I've had one, you know, book. I mean, I've had some that have come out in hardcover, but in this way, you know, right. so it, it, I think this is kind of like my debut, even though I've written like tens of mysteries and, and just because with a hardcover, I want it to be substantial, mm -hmm. you know, I want it to look beautiful and that's what Soho did. And, yeah. yeah. Covers are resting. Now, okay, let's talk. Was it the title always Clark and Division? It was always Clark and Division. Always the, the title. And what about the cover? Did you play around with that a lot? Well, Soho had given me like four different options. And um, I, I sent it out to all different people. A lot of booksellers. I think mm -hmm. booksellers are a good, you know, mm -hmm. place to get feedback. And um, so, yeah, and everybody had their favorite, um, I, you know, Sometimes I like the whole face, mm -hmm. but um, they had one with a whole face, but I was going, that does not look like any of the characters, how mm -hmm. I pictured them. Mm -hmm. So I kind of understand now, now why they do like only half a face, you know, yeah. it's kind of like a joke in some ways, but yeah. So it, it allows for the reader mm -hmm. to kind of fill in that, that the whole appearance of mm -hmm. the characters that are reading. And I love the font. Of Clark yes. and Division, that's like historic. And it's raised. It's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. Yeah. Your name and yeah. the down here, just all gorgeous. Yeah. I liked also. I like that it's a portion of the face, but you can tell, like with the lipstick, you can. There's, there's a look there. There's a look and yeah. feel, and it's like, which woman is it in the book? Like, which right. woman is this, or who? What is it representing? And you know, a lot of times the the person is from the back, and I'm hearing a lot of feedback from readers that they don't want to see any more women from the back and they don't understand that it's like really so that you don't define the character, but this is another very subtle way of doing it that I really yeah. loved. I really, mm -hmm. really did. So what's your writing process like? Is there a really messy first draft at the beginning or do you, do you plunge in and write the whole thing? Do you outline? What do you do? You know, I had on this book, I had really worked on the beginning and um, over, I mean, I even had some, uh, I received a small grant from my city of Pasadena to work on this book for some research, because um, as a mid-list author, you have to be very enterprising. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I am. I hustle. I'm a hustler. And so I had to do some public readings. So actually, I, I, I think the beginning was I kind of was going around in a circle and then I had to kind of jump over to Chicago. And once I leaped into Chicago, it was like easy going. It was mm -hmm. very it was not difficult because one thing just naturally led to another, to another. And I, I was happy. I mean, she is kind of an amateur sleuth, but mm -hmm. I didn't want 
it to feel like, oh, she's going to, you know, go here now. It was more the, the circumstances of her life just, mm -hmm. you know, opened up opportunities to ask someone something. And then from there, she just naturally went here and there. So, um, yeah, but uh, it was a weird, you know, like I said, I did a lot of the meat the writing during the pandemic and I knew that I could not be as productive as usual mm -hmm. just because you know like in March and April of last year 2020 even though physically I'm pretty much doing the same thing I'm always am like mm -hmm. I'm in my house and writing but I knew out there you know it was chaotic and terrible so you know I just cut my luckily I had done some work on it already so I just cut myself a break and say Naomi, if you just do this amount of words, it'll be fine. Yeah. So in the end, it it was good that I had extra time mm -hmm. to work. And then Juliet came back and, you know, she gave me feedback and I had to work super hard. And at that point, I was able to do a more focused uh, writing mm -hmm. and rewriting. At the beginning, we were wondering what the supply chain was, which we didn't know what it was. It's like, exactly. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Who knew how fruit really gets to the supermarket? Who right. knew who knew how toilet paper really got there? And who knew why some of the problems were being created? Because we all went home. Because in an office, yeah. a roll of toilet paper was this big. And now you need to make all these for home. It was all these things, like even meat was right. like, why yeah. was this such a problem? And it was because you usually sent meat to restaurants or to schools in large batches. Yeah. Yeah. And now you had to redo what you were doing. And it was all these things that we really never thought about in our lives. We just figured you went to the supermarket and you got it and that was it. And if they were out of something, it was coming tomorrow. And now all of a exactly. sudden it was, you may never get toilet paper again. I mean, yeah, it yeah. Just new. exactly. Yeah. And it was just crazy things that people went, look, if it's going to be a snowstorm around here, we always joke, we live in an area where everyone's got at least one SUV, like at least <laughs> one, but people run to get milk, eggs, and bread. Like they're never going to eat again. And usually you'd have to have about four feet of snow here to not be able to move, but everybody just acts like it's going to be over in three seconds. And I want to see how that's going to adjust after a pandemic where we learned we can get through, you know, we yeah. can. And people were very creative. Um, mm -hmm. One of the vendors I got food from, they normally supplied restaurants, mm -hmm. you know, and then you ordered it online and then you had to go and open up your trunk, you know, from your car and they put it in the trunk. I mean, yeah. I mean, it is in me. I mean, how are we going to process everything that's happened to us? Who knows? But, but you know, they're, they're interesting, the things that happen. We have a farm in town, which I never even, I know there's a farm. I've driven past this farm for 31 years. Let's get real. And I was looking at the farm one day and they said they were selling like packages of meat and you could get two, two steaks, you could get, and there was like, there's a range of what we could do. I was like, never even thought about this place being there, that there was like, you know, butcher capabilities that you could go down and buy in quantity. Never gave a second thought. And people said, oh, yeah, I did that all the time before. I think this will be a great book for book groups. I think it'll be a great book for book, book groups. Is there a discussion guide available on your website? Um, I think there's one in the ebook, but is there something available um, on your website as well? Right now, I have another map that's more detailed than the map that's in the book. And I do have a reader's guide, and I have to actually... Um, contact Soho and I'll, I'll put it on my website as well. So if you go to Clark and Division, there'll be a, a place you can click. Place you can click for that. Yeah. And you know what else too? In the back of the book here, you've got some great resources of for more reading. If you could add those to your website too, because in case anybody borrows the book from the library or something like that, they'd be able to have those available. Because I think that when people finish reading the book, they're going to want to read more. Mm -hmm. And you've got terrific resources back there. And I think that'd be another thing for people to share. Um, are you available if people want to do book group discussion? Of course, of course. Zoom? And yeah. they just reach out to you on your website? Yes, that's the best way. That's like perfect. Um, let me just see what's next. Well, wait a second. Wait, Allison Hiroto um, narrates mm -hmm. the audio book. Did you select her? And what's the process on that? I did recommend um, her. She had done one of my short stories for one of the um, Akashic Noir series. And it, ten, uh, it turns out that she has some relatives that I know here in California. So when um, I heard that the book had been sold for audio, um, I immediately contacted the producers. And, and with Allison, there were actually, a, it's really wonderful right now because we have a lot of diverse narrators. Mm -hmm which was not the case when I was first published in 2004. 
So I listen to both of them, but Allison has this brightness in her voice mm -hmm. that I thought, and she's done some, you know, she did Pachinko, she, she's done oh. some Haruki Murakami books. So she's a very established um, reader and actress. So I thought it was a great fit. So I re recommended her and they got her and yeah, I'm, and I'm so pleased. And she reached out to me. She uh, resonated with the story, you know, because she had family members who had been in camp. So. Oh, that's like perfect. It's just yeah, perfect. Yeah. Those of you listening to the audio, there's some like backgrounds there as well. So what's next? Did I hear that there's something called Evergreen happening? That there's like yeah. another book? Tell me about it. <laughs> So yeah, this book was a standalone, but you know, there, you know, I the way it ends, I think people want a little more. So there will be a follow-up. Oh, and great. it is called Evergreen. The only thing I'm um, saying about it is Evergreen is a neighborhood in um, Boyle Heights, which is in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and it's set in 1946. 1946. It's two years after the yeah. setting of this book. Okay. It's like, what's going to happen next? Well, I'm ready yeah. for what's going to happen next. So <laughs> how far along are you? Is it like a next year book or a two year book? Or what are we talking about? Um, do you think? It's due next year. <laughs> due next it's year. Due, okay. due. So it'll probably be coming out the following year. Yeah. Following year in 2023. And, and, it'll ha uh, and I hope it has another beautiful map. And um, yeah, oh, I so hope so too. <laughs> It just added to the story because I kept referring back to it because, and also every time she left, like where she was, you know, the apartment, she didn't know where to go. So she like try to figure out, well, where's that street? And where's that street? And where are they going to cross? And then I have to come back. And then parts that weren't safe. And she was trying to mark those off in her head as well as what was going on. So yeah, uh, it, it's just such a good book. And it, it's like, I highly recommend it. Like, and if you're in a book group, that's looking for something that it's World War II, but it's not really just World War II. It's really about life. It's about multiculturalism. There's just so much, it, it checks off so many of the boxes that people are looking for to have in a book. And a lot of people are saying, I don't want to read anything else about World War II, but this is a completely different story about what was going on. It's happening here. And we haven't had a lot written on what happened here. Everything happens in France, England, Germany, Russia, not here. Yeah. So, yeah. Really, really great. Well, I look forward to reading the next one. Go back to writing. You're dismissed. You go back to writing now. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much for having me, Carol. Really. Oh, and we look it. forward to seeing you, seeing you in person again soon. Yes. Sounds great. And for everybody else, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to.